The Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of the mind, examining the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. Perceptions is brought to you by the Edgewood Church of Christ in Columbus, Georgia, as an effort to promote more Bible study and to urge people to live their lives according to its teaching. Thank you for joining us in our study today of the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. Hope that you would join with us as we look at Paul's efforts in the city of Athens, Greece. By way of review, we've looked at what uh, historians tell us about Athens as being a center of literature and art, as well as a political center, an intellectual center. And uh, it was the university city of the world. Uh, we saw what historians say about it in that they describe it as being a city that had a lot of scientists and philosophers as, as well as sculptors and people in all walks of art. It was the seat of the democratic form of government and uh, as Greece introduced that to the world itself. Paul came to the city of Athens and while he was there, he saw the city full of idols. We made the observation in our last study of the 17th chapter of Acts how that uh, uh, some have said there were more gods in Athens, Greece than there were men. And Paul saw a city that was full of idols. Mountains and valleys and down every street of the city uh, there was evidence of the pagan religious environment of the city of Athens, Greece. And while Paul was there, the Bible says that his spirit was provoked within him. Uh, he felt uh, very strongly uh, the responsibility that he had as a messenger of Christ to preach the gospel uh, in the midst of those people. Then we find in verse 17 beginning some of the things that Paul faced. He went to the synagogue of the Jews as was his normal custom and spoke to those people and uh, then he went into the marketplace as well where people gathered on a daily basis, transacted business and so forth. He even faced the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers and we looked at what the Epicureans and the Stoics basically believed. The Epicureans believe that matter is eternal, that is that the universe was not created by an almighty being such as God. The Stoics, on the other hand, believed in asceticism. They believed in punishing the body, and their chief aim was that of apathy and indifference. And we have even a saying today in which we refer to people as being rather Stoic. Uh, they are indifferent in their appearance. Well, that's where it came from. But also we find in verse 18 where that there were some uh, who basically misunderstood the teaching of Paul. Some said, uh, as they encountered him, what would this babbler say? Others, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. Uh, they looked upon Paul as being some kind of a, a street preacher who derived his living from the generous support of people who would simply donate to him. And uh, what would this babbler say? And he seems to be a setter forth of strange deities, strange gods, as he spoke about Jesus Christ and the resurrection. And we find in verse 19 that they took hold of him and brought him unto the Areopagus, that is a reference to Mars Hill in the city of Athens, Greece. And when they brought him to the Areopagus, they said, May we know what this new teaching is which is spoken by thee. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know therefore what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the strangers sojourning there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. They sat around evidently every single day discussing whatever it was that was the subject for that particular point in time in order to learn new things. 
they just simply engaged in this auditory and this discussion and exchange of ideas and so forth. So they brought Paul before those who gathered in Mars Hill and they wanted to know, what is this teaching that you're talking about? What do you mean by this? Uh, you're, you're setting forth something very strange to our ears in telling us about Jesus. And so it was that Paul made one of the greatest sermons recorded in the New Testament. Read with me from Acts 17, beginning with verse 31, when Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, and here's what he said. Ye men of Athens, in all things I perceive that you are very religious. For as I passed along and, passed, uh, and, and observed the objects of your worship, I found an al also an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore ye worship in ignorance, this I set forth unto you. The God that made the world and all things therein, He being Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is He served by men's hands as though He needed anything. Seeing He Himself giveth to all life and breath and all things, and He made of one every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed seasons and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek God, if haply they might feel after Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of you. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain even of your own poets have said, for we are His offspring. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and device of man. The times of ignorance, therefore, God overlooked, but now He commandeth men that they should all everywhere repent. Inasmuch as He hath appointed a day in which He would judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He hath ordained. For He hath given assurance unto all men and that hath raised him from the dead. What a magnificent sermon Paul uh, preached on that occasion. Notice what he said about, first of all, Athenian worship. Paul said, as I passed along, as I was traversing up and down the streets of Athens, Greece, I saw all of your objects of worship, and I found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. And uh, so uh, Paul took advantage of that situation and related unto them about the true God of heaven. In Romans chapter 10, verse 1 beginning, Paul said, Brethren, my heart's desire, my supplication to God is for them that they may be saved, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Well, of course, in Athens, Greece, these people had no idea about the true God. And they were afraid of somehow or another offending any God. And so they erected an altar with the inscription to an unknown God, lest they leave out a God and cause that God to be angry against them. So they were totally ignorant of Jehovah God, and like those mentioned by Paul in that passage in Romans chapter 10 that I read, they sought to establish a righteousness of their own. Religious people, and by the way, man himself is by his very nature religious in orientation. He's going to believe in some higher being for the most part. Now, I realize that there are some atheists in the world today, but by and large, mankind is worshipful. And if he's ignorant of Jehovah God, he's going to establish some system of religion nonetheless and bow down and worship to gods of his own invention. Well, that was the case with the Athenians. They had erected this altar to an unknown God. And Paul said, Therefore, what you worship in ignorance... This I set forth unto you. Now notice what he said about God. Verse 24, The God that made the world and all things therein, He being Lord of heaven and earth, 
dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is he served by men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Notice what he said about God. He said that God is the Creator. He is the one who is Lord of heaven and earth. He dwells not in temples made with hands. He's the Creator. In the Old Testament book of Psalms 33, uh, we find this statement beginning in verse 6 as it relates to the creation of God. The psalmist said, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the deep in storehouses. He let all the earth fear Jehovah. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Oh, yes. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them. He spake, it was done. He commanded, it was made. Jehovah God is created. That's one thing that Paul said about God in this passage. Furthermore, he said that He is the preserver of human life. He's not served by men's hands as though He needed anything from man. That's not it at all. Contrary to the gods that were worshipped in Athens, Greece, they brought to their gods all kinds of things as if their God needed things from them. But not Jehovah God. That's not the situation. But He gives to all life and breath and all things. Your very existence on earth is directly tied in to the fact that God Himself is real. He's not some kind of imagination is not some kind of object that has been created by the hand of man. He is the life giver. Not only that, but he says that God is spirit. God is spirit. John chapter 4 and verse 24, that's what Jesus said concerning God too. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Notice what he says about man. He talks about the brotherhood of man in verse 26. He made of one every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed seasons and bounds of their habitation. There is a commonality in the makeup of human beings. We have different colors of skin, yes. We come from different parts of the world. We have different customs and all of that. But Paul said that God made something common to all men. There is the brotherhood of man. And then he affirms in verse 27 that man is worshipful creature. That they should seek God, if haply they might feel after Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. By nature, man is a worshiping being. That's what Paul is saying here about man. Not only that, but he says that man is dependent upon God. For in him we live and move and have our being. That's what he says in verse 28. Then notice what he says about idolatry. Being then the offspring of God, that is, us as human beings are the offspring of God. We're part of the creation. We ought not to think that God is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and device of man. Oh no, you don't make God out like that. In fact, in the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament, uh, we have uh, this rather uh, ironical or tongue-in-cheek type of description about the gods worshipped by pagans. In Jeremiah chapter 10, 1 through 6, Hear ye then the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the nations. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the nations are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vanity. 
For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They're like a palm tree of turned work and speak not. They must needs be born, that is, carried along, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither is it in them to do good. He's talking about false gods made by the hands of men. Man goes out in the forest, he cuts down a tree. And from that he begins to whittle out some kind of a statue. Well, other parts of the wood he takes and puts in the fireplace and burns for heat. But other parts of it he takes and he carves it out, he decks it up with silver and gold, and he fastens it with nails and with hammers so that it can't move. Uh, they're like the palm tree. They don't speak anything. In fact, they can't even go on their own power. They have to be carried about by somebody else. He said, don't be afraid of them. They can't do evil. They can't do good. So it is that Paul reminds these folks in Athens, Greece, about idolatry. And he says unto them, Don't think that the true God is made out of gold or silver or, or stone or graven by art and device of man. But then he talks about repentance. He said in verse 30, The times of ignorance therefore God overlooked. But now he commandeth men that they should all everywhere repent. Repent of sin. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. That's what we learn in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. We've all sinned. We need to repent, turn around, turn our life in a different direction, and serve Jehovah God. That, of course, is the message that Paul leaves to these folks. You need to turn away from your superstition and turn and embrace Jehovah God. Repent of the wrong in your life. Now, this is not just worldly sorrow. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 and 10, talks about the difference between worldly sorrow on one hand and godly sorrow on the other. Uh, worldly sorrow is so different than godly sorrow. Godly sorrow involves the genuine turning around of the life and a deep contrition for the wrong that has been done in violation of the will of God. So it is, God commandeth men that they should all everywhere repent. That's what he says about repentance. Now notice what he says about the judgment. Inasmuch as he hath appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. Yes, indeed, there will be a judgment day. You and I can certainly count on that. God has made that promise. He has appointed a day. I don't know when that day will be. Nobody does. God knows when it is. He's appointed a day in which he would judge the world in righteousness He's not going to make a mistake about that judgment. Sometimes in our civil courts, uh, a judge comes up with a wrong sentence and decision with regard to the guilt or the innocence of the person that's on trial. But God's not going to make a mistake. Uh, he'll judge the world in righteousness. Whereof he, by the man whom he hath ordained, that is Christ, and he's given assurance unto all men, and it hath raised him from the dead. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gives us a picture of the judgment scene. And he talks about how that there will be a great division. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the angels with Him, then shall He sit on the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all the nations, and He shall separate them one from another as the shepherd separated the sheep from the goats. And He shall say to the sheep on His right hand, uh, come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But the ghost on his left hand, he will say to them, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. Yes, there will be a judgment day. 
John in Revelation chapter 20 beginning with verse 11 said that I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of the things which were written in the books according to the works. And so it is that John reminds us that there will be a judgment day. You and I can be assured of that. And that's what Paul is saying here to these folks at Athens, Greece. That God's not going to overlook ignorance. But He commands men that they should all everywhere repent. And the reason for that is because He has appointed a day in which He's going to make every man accountable to Him. And we're going to stand there in that judgment day. The whole address that Paul makes here could be repeated perhaps in five or six minutes. Just read it, what he had to say. And yet it, it is a, it's a message that outweighs all the volumes of philosophy and theology and diluted homiletics. It's a message that really reaches to the very core and depth of man's being and addresses uh, the unbelievers in the city of Athens and tries to bring them to the point of belief. So he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. You can count on it. Now then, notice the reaction to the message. There was first of all ridicule. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Some mocked. But then there was procrastination on the part of some. Others said, We will hear thee concerning this yet again. Procrastination. Putting it off to another time. Sometimes people react to the gospel message in the same way. Now, they don't just outright reject it, but they procrastinate. They put it off. They delay. They don't make any commitment. You see, in the book of Acts chapter 24, that we'll get to a little bit later on and as we continue our study of the book, we find that there was a man uh, to whom the gospel had been preached. And uh, after certain days, Felix, with Drusilla, his wife, who was a Jewess, sent for Paul, heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And he reasoned of righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix needed to hear that message. For indeed, he was involved in corruption. He had lost control of his own life in many respects. And he needed to realize that there was a judgment to come. There was an accountability, a day of reckoning. And Felix, when he, Felix, when he heard that message, said, go, he was terrified. But he said, Go thy way for this time, and when I have a convenient season, I will call thee unto me. He delayed. He procrastinated. He put it off. And as far as the divine record goes, we have no knowledge of him ever becoming a Christian. That was the moment. That was the time when he should have made a positive response to what Paul had to say as he reasoned about self-control, and uh, as he reasoned about righteousness and the judgment to come. The iron was hot. Unfortunately, some people, when they hear the truth, when they hear the gospel message, they know it to be true, but they don't respond to it. And here these Athenians, when they heard these matters, they, some of them mocked. Others decided to put it off. We will hear the yet concerning this again. But Paul went out from among them, and certain men clave unto him, and believed, among whom also was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. So his efforts were not wasted. Even an Areopagite, a person who frequented Mars Hill, and sat with those philosophers and debated various issues of the day, 
he became a convert along with Damaris and others with him. Certain men clave unto him and believed. That's the same kind of reaction of, on the part of some Jews in Acts chapter 2. When they were pricked in their heart, they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41 of Acts chapter 2 says, They then that received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. Maybe you've come to that point in your life as well, where you need to make some kind of decision. As we look here in Paul's case in the city of Athens, as far as the biblical record goes, there's no reference made to his ever returning to the city of Athens. There's no record of his ever addressing another word to the people of Athens, as far as we know. So, some of those passed up a wonderful opportunity. Don't pass it up yourself. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I hope that you do, and I've, I'm sure you do, or else you wouldn't be viewing this program. Will you then turn away from sin in your life and seek for someone in the churches of Christ who will baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins, as Jesus directs in Mark 16, 16? We hope indeed that you will, and if we can assist you or some congregation of the churches of Christ near you can help you in obeying the gospel of Christ. We invite you and encourage you to become a Christian. Don't put it off. Don't delay. Strike while the iron is hot, while you have that noble resolution in your heart. Thank you for viewing today, and may God bless you in your life and in your efforts to serve God. Thank you for studying the Bible with us on Perceptions. If you desire to study the Bible in the privacy and convenience of your home, please call us for a free correspondence course that will be conducted entirely by mail. Our telephone number is 706-561-3793, or you may write to us at Edgewood Church of Christ, 4102 Macon Road, Columbus, Georgia, 31907. Our email address is edgewoodcfc at aol.com. The Edgewood Church of Christ also invites you to attend their public services each Sunday. Bible classes are available for all ages at 10 a.m. The worship services are scheduled at 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. each Sunday.